Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. The Russian-Ukraine war continues to have a toll on the global world economy and uh, event, uh, even private individuals, John Lisa, among others, continue to suffer the consequences. Freedom of speech has been hijacked as a Ukraine-based website, Mydro Voreta, continue to add experts, journalists, and even minors to the uh, now infamous Ukrainian kill list. Journalists continue to suffer injury, death threats, harassment, and ostracism in a present-day society. However, being determined to speak about this attack on critical thinking and on freedom of speech in the global information war, a few elected officials and others have spoken out, saying it is during the time of war that uh, uh, the truth must preview and ex an executive intelligence uh, review EIR in September hosted an international conference and have continued to create avenues to denounce the inhuman activities of the government of Kiev that continue to present uh, itself or herself as a victim yet names of people with contrary ideologies about uh, the government have been put on the Ukrainian hit list sparking fear and controversy Amid all these, the United States Congress and Parliament of Europe have remained muted, bringing more controversy. And of course, this is where the bond of contention lies. And of course, uh, we, during this program, we're going to analyze to see what this hit list is all about and how it is imperative to denounce uh, the inhuman activities. <laughs> Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Hello to you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us on this uh, last edition of the program in uh, Views on the Continent uh, for the week. Today we are revisiting the Ukrainian crisis, of course, but we are now talking about the fact that the freedom of speech has been hijacked as the war uh, between the crisis between Russia and Ukraine continue. And of course, the global world is facing uh, the severe uh, consequences of this war. Uh, uh, the Ukrainian hit list is what we are talking about today and of course we have experts who are going to bring to light what this hit list is all about and why it is targeting uh, individuals, experts, uh, journalists and even minors and of course uh, looking at how uh, the, the critical thinking has been hijacked because people who do not support uh, or do not share the same ideologies with the, the government of Kiev uh, happen to be attacked, uh, the uh, enemies of the, the, the government, and of course uh, their names listed on uh, the hit list. How can we put an end to this? This is what we are going to discuss in the course of the program, Views on the Continent, a one-hour program, a platform where you get to share your views concerning uh, issues that are affecting the global world. Uh, without wasting time, we'll go to discover the panel, uh, great gentlemen joining us this day to bring more analysis on how uh, the freedom of speech has been uh, hijacked in uh, this uh, present era where the world is uh, suffering from uh, the crisis ongoing. It's with delight uh, that I will go to the United Kingdom, uh, to the United States of America, I beg your pardon, I'm introducing Jason Ross. He is director of the La Roche Foundation uh, organization. Hello to you, sir, and thanks for joining us this day on the Pan-African Television Afrique Media. Hello, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure hoping that we're going to have a fruitful conversation regarding our topic for discussion today. Leaving uh, Mr. Ross, we're going to Germany. We're meeting uh, Mr. Halle Schlanker, his Vice President Schiller Institute. Hello to you, sir. Thanks for joining you on the Pan-African Television. Well, hello. I'm very happy to be with you and uh, also with my friend Jason here. And I 
I think will provide some very interesting information for your viewers. In data, it is time to uh, bring more insight to educate the global world, especially uh, this part of the African uh, continent about what is happening. Uh, like we already underlined uh, the, the war, the crisis in Ukraine, uh, the consequences are not only felt by those out there, but it is affecting the global economy, and it is very imperative for us to engage in this uh, constructive discussion that seek to bring solutions to the uh, problems of, of the world. Uh, I will start with you, Mr. Uh, Jason Rose. Uh, of course, our topic for today is talking about the, the call for uh, the freedom of speech uh, in global uh, information war. Uh, we noted that in, in sometime in September, uh, your organization organized a conference to throw more light, to educate the masses on this uh, uh, Ukraine hit list. And, and the latest development shows that the president of Uganda, Yoram Museveni, has been added to this list. So can we in a, a have a holistic uh, uh, approach of what this hit list is all about and how they uh, operate. Certainly, thank you. So the issue of the Ukraine crisis affects the entire world for several reasons. One is that countries are being asked or told that they have to join a bloc, that they have to choose their alliance. Are they with NATO? Are they with Russia? And this can have grave consequences, including economic sanctions, political, implications, countries should not have to make this choice. The other global impact of the Ukraine crisis is an economic one, where there are significant disruptions in the provision of energy, of fertilizer, of agricultural inputs. This is worsening food insecurity that is already a very devastating crisis on the planet and making it worse. So the danger of this hit list is that People like myself, like Sarah Harley, who are part of independent institutes, who are speaking out for negotiations, for peace, for an end to the huge flow of weapons that will only extend the war, instead of being treated as individual citizens who care about our future, the Ukrainian government says that we are tools of Vladimir Putin, that we are mouthpieces for the Kremlin, and then they create hit lists on which many people have already been killed and they write over the pictures of those who have been assassinated, liquidated. I don't want to be liquidated. And they also use this to help have censorship on the social media, where if you say things that are not approved of, then, you know, the, the NATO trolls bombard your account with reports, they try to get you banned from Twitter, banned from Facebook. And this is an extreme danger to free speech. We should be able to talk and say what we think. Isn't this the democracy that NATO is supposedly defending in Ukraine? Where is democracy if your political opinion put you on a hit list? This is not democracy. to uh, put an end uh, to the crisis and see uh, that uh, the, the world uh, takes uh, its normalcy. And we, uh, we are talking you like you uh, underlined uh, the, the, the crisis is that people are actually suffering. Even here in Africa, uh, the, the brunt of uh, uh, Russian Ukraine crisis, and it is imperative that constructive discussions are put in place to put an end. But then, when free speech is attacked, that's where it becomes uh, problematic. I quite remember uh, that when this crisis started, there was a lot of, or there were a lot of subjective reporters. And today, we, we, we we have come to this extent of seeing uh, that uh, the, the government, the hit leader, uh, targeting uh, 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 people, which becomes uh, very uh, problematic. Uh, coming to you, uh, uh, Mr. Halley, uh, let's continue in this uh, uh, perspective. Uh, we, we highlighted in the preamble that uh, uh, the, the, the United States or the, the Western uh, part of the con uh, continent have been very uh, silent uh, as far as this hit list is concerned. So why do, what do you explain uh, is the reason why the 
mainstream or Western media has remained silent to this and uh, how can the, the narratives be changed? Not only silent, they are participating in it through the support of the US government and, and NATO. The people who run the hit list, the, the, the one, it starts with the committee to counter disinformation. Sounds innocent enough, but these are the ones who are gathering the names of journalists that they say are hostile to the Ukrainian people. And they have called us, and I'm on that list as is Jason, they've called us information terrorists. Now, their meetings started, the first big public meeting was in July of this year where they put out the first list. But what they're doing is putting out these lists as a way of trying to intimidate people who live outside of Ukraine, because many of the people on the list now don't live in Ukraine. But this is also a way of changing the subject, because what is it? That, why is the Schiller Institute so heavily represented on this list? 31 of the first 72 people named spoke at our conferences. And what did they talk about? We're talking about a new security order and a new financial architecture. Now, this, is, this gets to the heart of the matter. The battle in Ukraine is not about the freedom and democracy in Ukraine because the Western governments don't care about the freedom and democracy in Ukraine. They don't care about prosperity for Ukrainians. If they did, they wouldn't send the International Monetary Fund into Ukraine to organize the economy. And people in Africa know what this means. What happens when the IMF comes into your country? You get put under austerity. You're threatened with cut off of credit and trade. And what's happened is that there's an emergence of a new financial system that's taking place with Russia and China at the heart of it. And they're committed to the idea of a multilateral world order rather than a unipolar world order. And so that's why NATO and the United States are targeting Russia. And anyone who speaks against that unipolar order is being accused of being a mouthpiece for Putin. It becomes a bone of uh, contention uh, uh, because uh, uh, some some pundits hold that uh, at a time of a war like this, uh, there is need for 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 different schools of thought to bring uh, solutions to to the problems. Like uh, the war started by escalating, uh, we don't know if there is an end in sight, but people fear of another graph, a uh, uh, level of the war. But then uh, with uh, the perspective, uh, like uh, the one uh, uh, experts have taken, calling out for peace, talking the truth, eh? uh, there is need to, to continue. Uh, coming back to you, uh, Jason Rose, uh, they talked about, uh, Mr. Halley highlighted uh, something talking about the new security other, and it's actually bringing me to what I wanted us to talk about. Is it that uh, in wanting to define the new world order, uh, superpowers have missed the course and and the, 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 the whole world the global world now face the, the consequences uh, we, we we talked about the demise of a Russian journalist who, who died uh, and of course apparently she was on uh, the, the hit list so is this the new world order that is taking another dimension yes I think that is an example of the way that they want to force this new order so the, across the, the so-called West, Europe, the United States, so forth, the economy is in terrible condition. Financially, very, uh, very bad direction. The inflation rate is going up. They're creating more money. The price of energy in Europe, for example, where energy was relatively inexpensive for the, the world level, now it's going up two times, three times, five times, ten times. They've lost their energy supply from Russia. People are being told that they have to uh, reduce the number of washing, how much washing they do. They have to change the temperature of their homes. They should stop using their automobiles because this is how you stop Vladimir Putin. So what they're saying is that economic depression, that an increase in poverty, lowered living standards, 
they say this is good. This is the new world order that they offer. They also do this through the green policy. They say, oh, the planet is in danger, so to have a good future, we must be poor today. And they say that countries that are developing must slow down their rate of development, must reduce their carbon dioxide emissions, even where there are people in poverty. That is the order of the United Kingdom and the United States, the city of London and Wall Street. That is what they offer to the world. But if you look at the new institutions that are coming into being, for example, the alliance known as the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, this is very important to bring the major nations, specifically India, Brazil, South Africa, they are not members of the Security Council, but they represent extreme importance on the planet. More countries want to join the BRICS the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. More countries want to join this. We have the New Development Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the potentials with the African Development Bank. So the world really has a choice of development and growth in cooperation. Maybe China's Belt and Road Initiative can be an important part of this, or the old colonial system that is offered by London, which is no development, enforced poverty, and war, if necessary, to maintain that. And that's what we're seeing today. You know, Russia is a sovereign country. It makes its own decisions. That's not okay to London. That sovereignty is a threat to their desire for a world colonial empire as they have had for centuries. So today it is Russia and China. In the future, what will this mean for other countries? What will this mean for South Africa? What will this mean for Cameroon? What will this mean for Pakistan? Countries are being told to make a choice and it should not be a necessary choice. Countries should be free to choose their own development strategies, to choose their own colleagues, their own collaborators. They should not have to choose between the West and Russia and China, for example. So it, this is why it, it, it's so important to break through and have a full discussion of the causes of the Ukraine crisis. The crisis did not begin in February with President Putin's decision to begin his military operation. This crisis goes back to 2014, to the unconstitutional change of government in Ukraine, and it goes back further than that, to the effects of the Cold War and the expansion of NATO and treating Russia today as a threat. When it is not the Soviet Union of 30 years ago. This old outlook of enemies, it's really an old outlook and it should be replaced by a collaborative one. Uh, those uh, joining us about this is Views on the Continent and you are on the Pan-African Television Africa uh, Media. We continue analyzing our topic for today. We continue in the same perspective uh, with uh, Mr. Hurley. Uh, let's try to talk politics now because uh, some pundits uh, feel that uh, the, the West is trying uh, to use Ukraine to fight uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine is in the middle of the war between uh, uh, the, the Western powers and, and Russia. How uh, feasible or what is the, the, the veracity of the statement? And of course, how can we ch uh, reverse this? Because uh, c c c uh, civilians have lost their lives in, in this war since it started in February. So how can we turn this uh, on the path of the population and put an end to it? Well, I think you have to look at the, who are the biggest victims of this war? It's the Ukrainian people, not because of Russia, but because of the puppet government of Zelensky, 
There was an attempt made by the Russians and the Ukrainians in March of this year, one month after the fighting started, to reach a ceasefire. It was moving very well with, with uh, Turkish uh, cooperation, and it was stopped. Boris Johnson from the United Kingdom was sent in by NATO to tell Zelensky to stop the negotiations. Now, how many Ukrainians have died since then because of this order coming from NATO? And why did NATO make that order? They did that because the goal of NATO was stated by the U.S. Defense Secretary in March at a meeting at Rammstein Air Base in Germany. He said, our goal is to weaken Russia. That's been the goal since the end of the Cold War. And it's important to note that it, when the Cold War ended, the U.S. promised the Russians that NATO would not move one inch eastward. Those are the words of James Baker, the Secretary of State. Since that time, NATO has moved a thousand kilometers eastward, added something like 16 new members, putting offensive weapons on the border of Russia. And who's in the middle of this? As you point out, the Ukrainians, the Ukrainian people. They're not being given freedom. The coup in 2014 that brought the, the current government into power, that was the Poroshenko government, then Zelensky, that coup was carried out by $5 billion spent by the United States, according to the Under Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland. Now, many people in Africa are familiar with this, color revolutions, regime change, when a, a government is too committed to defending the standard of living of its people in Africa, it gets overthrown. And it's accused of corruption. It's accused of, of stealing. It's, it's accused of, of violating democracy. And a new government is put in, which acts under the orders of the international banks. Now, that was done in Iraq. It was done in Africa, to, in Libya, to Gaddafi. It was done in Syria. They tried to do it in Syria. They tried to do it in Venezuela. And they did it in Ukraine. And so the, and this is what has to be discussed. Does this make the people of Ukraine better? The fact is that since 2014, the standard of living in Ukraine has dropped by anywhere between 20 and 40 percent, depending on which survey you look at. In other words, after they were given their so-called freedom, they've had a catastrophic decline in per capita income. And then they're being used, as we call it, a battering ram against Russia. Now, if you discuss that, you're accused of changing the subject because the only subject they want to talk about is Putin and Russia, up to and including the point of canceling Russian culture, accusing Tchaikovsky of being an agent of Putin's imperialism. You know, so we're, we're dealing with a narrative which is makes no sense. And if the Ukrainian people were not under this wartime conditions, I'm sure they would not be going along with this because the coup in 2014 was heavily funded and backed by NATO. And how do you deal with a NATO coup? Well, they tried to get an agreement between the Ukrainian government, Germany, France, and Russia to stop the attacks on Eastern Ukraine. It was signed by Poroshenko, who said he only did it to buy time Zelensky ran for president saying he would fulfill the terms of the Minsk agreement. But when he became president, he dropped it. And we now know why, because the neo-Nazis in his administration said if he negotiates with the Russians, he will be hanging from a tree in a public square in Kiev. And then they come along and say, here, we'll give you all this money. We'll give you all of this free press and adulation, but you have to fight against Russia. And that's where we are right now. And anyone who talks against it is targeted as an enemy of Ukraine. I, mean, I, I take this very seriously. I have some friends who are Ukrainian, historians, professors, who, because of their patriotism, rallied to the cause, but they know that it's a false cause. But they're afraid to speak out. One of the Schiller Institute of collaborators, Natalia Vitrenko, 
who is the head of the uh, popular or the uh, progressive socialist party of Ukraine, her party was outlawed in a kangaroo court. And her co-members have been threatened, have been jailed, are intimidated. 16 political parties have been shut down in Ukraine. Is that democracy? The Ukrainian opposition media shut down. So, you know, th there's a false narrative here. And I, I think what's important is that the U.S. is trying to impose what they say is the one model. There's only one model of development that's acceptable. Well, I think many countries in Africa don't want to be told what to do. In fact, the South African foreign minister told Blinken, don't come here and lecture us. Don't bully us. We're a sovereign nation. And I think the, we see that in the United Nations, the refusal of many African governments to support the U.S. sanction policy. So we need to have that discussion. But unfortunately, in the West, you can't have it without being threatened. Indeed, uh, it is uh, uh, very difficult to talk uh, or speak the truth without uh, being threatened. And of course, that's why experts have uh, uh, had to, to, to breathe it all, or to breathe it all, to see that uh, they will continue to talk, to talk constructively to an end is put uh, to what is happening out there in uh, Ukraine and Russia, which is affecting the global economy. Uh, while talking, uh, uh, Mr. Haley, you highlighted uh, uh, that uh, uh, Ukraine is presenting herself as the victim. But today, we are talking about this hit list that is circulating. Of course, it didn't start today. It came again to the fore with uh, the, uh, the the crisis, the, the Russia and Ukraine crisis. So why should Ukraine present itself, especially uh, to, to the global world, as a victim, yet people uh, live under fear uh, or, and or being tagged uh, Russian uh, propagandists only because they do not uh, uh, share the same ideology or maybe they uh, uh, stand against uh, the, 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 the decisions of the government in Kiev, which they think are not favorable to the citizens. I think uh, you can answer this, uh, uh, Jason Russ. The question is directed to you, Jason Russ. I'm sorry, I muted. Um, okay. I think NATO is using Ukraine in multiple ways. One of them is using Ukrainian troops with NATO weaponry to attack Russia. This is stated openly. The Secretary of Defense of the United States says that the goal here is to weaken Russia and that if weapons are sent to Ukraine and they're used by Ukrainian troops, who are then themselves in physical danger, of course, of being killed in war, that this achieves the goal of weakening and harming Russia. Similarly, Ukraine is being used as an information war. So rather than NATO countries directly saying that NATO citizens may not oppose NATO policy, they get Ukraine to do it. Ukraine presents itself as a victim, as you have said. And therefore, drawing on sympathy says that their victimhood includes propagandists around the world who wish them harm. Now, as Harley Schlanger has said, and, and I say myself, we don't want harm for Ukraine. We want peace, a negotiated peace that will save lives, that will save billions of dollars worth of economic destruction. This is the, a real care for the future of Ukraine. And the way that Ukraine presents its victimhood does two other things. One, it ignores the role of Ukraine in creating the conditions for the current military operation. And two, it makes it too local. It presents this as a Ukraine-Russia controversy when truly this is a NATO, the United States, United Kingdom, NATO versus Russia uh, controversy, a NATO versus Russia conflict. So the best way to prevent Ukraine from being a victim to further devastation 
is to stop the conditions that are causing war. And as Harley Schlanger said, there were negotiations in March, in April, negotiations that were attacked directly by Boris Johnson, who flew to Kiev to say don't negotiate, or the recent statement by Zelensky, where he said that he would not negotiate with Russia if Putin is its president. I don't think Putin is going anywhere. So, you know, what kind of what kind of future does this create? And then, you know, there's a real responsibility both on people, citizens of NATO countries, like Harley Schlanger and myself, but really I think the world at large to help send a message to say, we do not want to choose sides in this conflict. We want peace. 87% of the people on the planet live in countries that are not going along with the anti-Russia sanctions. OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, is not going along with attempts to prevent Russia from exporting oil at, at a standard, at a reasonable price. So most of the world does not agree with the NATO war policy. And it's very important, I think, you know, for Americans, for other people in NATO countries to hear from so many other countries in the world about the effects that this conflict has on them and about their own sovereign ideas of what kind of world they would like. Even knowing the stance of uh, independent uh, countries on uh, why uh, uh, on the war in Russia and uh, Ukraine, uh, like you highlighted uh, uh, earlier on, uh, Chosen Ross, that uh, the, the way forward uh, towards putting an end to this uh, crisis is to to try to solve uh, the root cause of the crisis. And then uh, coming to you, Holly, how can the conditions creating the war be the mitigated to ensure that, uh, uh, that there is peace and, and the people, especially the, the Ukrainian people, do not live in fear? Well, I, I think the first step is to stop the flow of weapons. It doesn't help anybody except arms manufacturers to send these modern offensive weapons to Ukraine. And the idea that the US is going to continue to send weapons, they're putting more pressure on Germany to send weapons, uh, pressure on other countries to provide ammunition for the Ukrainian forces. That's a, a, a problem in the first place. Now, here's an irony. In the United States, the Family members of American men and women in the armed forces are not paid enough to provide food for their families. They're on food stamps, government programs to get cheap food to feed their children. And yet we're spending $60 billion to send weapons to Ukraine. Now, this is something that touches many, many families, the majority of families in the United States, but they have no access, or they think they have no access to talk to the Congress. And if you censor voices like ours, they're not hearing what they can do about it. Now, here are a couple of simple points. One of the issues was Ukraine demanding membership in NATO. And the Russians said they would not tolerate NATO forces on their border with modern offensive weapons, including possibly nuclear weapons. For the same reason, 60 years ago, John Kennedy took the world to the edge of nuclear war to stop Russian Soviet missiles from being placed in Cuba. Putin was making the same argument for Russia. He called for no membership in NATO for Ukraine, neutral status, security guarantees for Ukraine, and stop killing Russian language citizens in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine. And also denazification because there's a, a core of so-called Ukrainian nationalists that take their ideology from the Ukrainians in the 1940s who joined Hitler. But those are reasonable demands. Zelensky agreed that Ukraine should, would not be able to go into NATO. The idea of security guarantees, of course, he'd accept that. 
but he wouldn't accept the idea of pulling the troops back that were shelling eastern Ukraine that had killed 14,000 people so far. And he denies that there are Nazis in his government, when in fact there are pictures of these people at parades marching behind pictures of the Ukrainian Nazis of World War II, the same ones who were responsible, Ukrainian nationalists, for killing Jews, Hungarians, Poles, and Romanians, hundreds of thousands of them working with the Nazis in World War II. It's the allegiance to that ideology, that racialism, that Nazi racism, that has to stop, that Putin said is not tolerable. Now, what does the United States say about that? Oh, there are no Nazis in Ukraine. Well, the reason these Nazis were saved after World War II was the CIA and MI6 allowed them to come to the United States and Germany and protected them to use them against the Soviets. Well, the Soviet Union isn't there anymore. There's no need to have Nazis to protect people of Ukraine. So why will Zelensky not accept these terms? Well, I think that this is where you see the problem. It's the NATO countries, especially the United States and the British, who want this war. That's the issue. The British want to do something to weaken Russia for the same reason they organized World War I and World War II, because they didn't want a German-Russian alliance, because they thought that would threaten the British and the European empires. Yeah. Now, today, we just saw with the death of Queen Elizabeth, the discussion of the Commonwealth. Part of the problem in Africa, the reason Africa has not had a chance to have a full development, is because the Commonwealth represents a new form of empire using financial control to prevent the development of Africa, including the French and the French sections, the former French colonies, the British in particular. And the Russians are saying, be free, be sovereign. If you want to trade with China, you want to build rail systems, you want to build nuclear power plants, that's for you to decide. But the Western bankers say, no, you can't do that. And the green policy says, no, you'll heat up the planet. Well, that's nonsense. That's an excuse to kill Africans the same way they're killing Ukrainians. And so in a sense, this fight in Ukraine over the opposition to NATO and the sanctions is a fight for independence and sovereignty of African nations. And I'm very happy to say that the chairman of the African Union, Macky Sall from Senegal, said that the Africans will not join the side of the West against Russia. The South Africans have been clear on that. Many African leaders have been clear on that in the United Nations. And it shows that people who know colonialism best don't want to submit to the new form of colonialism called the Green New Deal and the Great Reset. Talking about the, the new form of colonialism, uh, to say that uh, the wind of change is, of course, uh, the positive wind of change across Africa. And, and you, you can tell uh, from the, the, the time that African nations decided not to be part of uh, the, uh, uh, the United Nations sanctions against uh, Russia. And of course, uh, a sovereign country like you underlined uh, in your analysis that a sovereign nation, an autonomous nation, has the right to choose what they want. And of course, coming to, uh, back to you, uh, Jason Ross, let's look at uh, the, uh, the, the partnership between the, the Africa, Russia, in the contemporary society. Uh, some uh, pundit, uh, when, when the crisis started, some pundit said that it's because the West, uh, Western countries, are losing grip of the African country. And of course, seeing that Russia is uh, uh, engaging into a win-win partnership with many African countries in the, the present day society. And since uh, it's difficult for, for, for the superpowers of powers that have been present on the continent Africa over the years to, to, to redefine or to cut their sphere of influence uh, in this uh, period, and seeing the presence of Russia, they decided to fight Russia back home using uh, Ukraine. How, how can we uh, understand the statement? Hmm. So I think that 
the example of Africa Russia relations is a good example of the potential to have another perspective, another viewpoint. So the kinds of technologies that, that Africa, uh, the kinds of collaboration that, that Russia brings to the, the table here include a lot in energy, of course, you know, in petroleum and natural gas, but also in high technologies, nuclear power, for example, nuclear research. Um, if nations want to build nuclear reactors, a very helpful potential partner is Rosatom. Um, with that many countries are developing relationships uh, with and or for things like fuel and this sort of thing. You know, I think it's important to look at some of the goals set by the African Union. So the Agenda 2063 outline that was created by the African Union in 2013, I mean, this is a full set of proposals for things like the Trans-African Highway System, for projects like the Grand Inga hydroelectricity complex that would be in the Democratic Republic of Congo, or the interbasin water transfer project to refill, and replenish Lake Chad and create more waterway navigation and shipping along the way through the Cherry and other rivers. So there's, there are, there's a huge wish list. There's a huge list of infrastructure projects, infrastructure goals, rail connecting all of the capitals of the nations across the continent. These are expressed African goals. And nations should be free to develop whatever partnerships make sense for them to achieve those goals. So when the United States sends Secretary of State Antony Blinken to go and complain and say that China puts countries into debt, I mean, really, what is the history of the IMF? How helpful is the World Bank right now? The World Bank that refuses to finance coal projects, which is a very inexpensive way of producing electricity. The World Bank that says, no, you can't have this inexpensive electricity. It's bad for the climate. So you're going to have to stay poor. So, uh, for example, the, the pipeline project that's proposed. Now, you know, of course, this is up to each nation to decide, but I see a lot of international condemnation of the East Africa pipeline project uh, involving Tanzania, where outside forces say, oh, this would be bad for the environment. Well, also, colonialism is an anti-development outlook. The British Empire, the French Empire, they look at colonialism as a way of extracting resources, but not of development. If a country is developing, if a country is becoming wealthy, if its citizenry is becoming more confident in their own futures, this is a country that is much harder to keep in the state of a colony. So part of the efforts to prevent Russian uh, influence or Russian partnerships with African nations or Chinese partnerships with African nations is to maintain the continent for the old colonial powers most prominently Britain and France. And this is, this is the past. This is not the future. This is the past and it's not the future, like you've said. Uh, like uh, uh, we underlined already uh, that critical thinking has been hijacked. And you rightly said that uh, th th this is the time that the African continent is trying to, to do what we call a, a check in to ensure that when they engage into partnership with FARS, it should uh, at least help the continent in its economic drive. And then we're looking at how uh, the fear, because of the fear of not being uh, enlisted or put uh, to that, uh, the hit list, uh, the Ukrainian hit list, the, 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 the critical thinking and free uh, speech or expression of speech has been hijacked. So what can you think, uh, what can be done in this present uh, 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 society to ensure that even in the time of war, 
people are able to speak, to bring constructive uh, analysis uh, that comes from critical thinking on how to bring lasting solutions to the uh, 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 global crisis, crisis that have effects not only on the country's concern, but on the global economy. So how can we uh, reverse this to ensure uh, that this hit list uh, is not uh, an impediment uh, uh, directing this question to you, Hali, that this hit list is not an impediment to critical thinking, which is very important in solving world's problems in today's world. Well, that's an important question. And we had a whole conference yesterday, a three hour conference on online, uh, the Executive Intelligence Review, which is one of our publications, uh, sponsored a dialogue of people who are on the hit list. Uh, one, a retired colonel, a very prominent American military official, uh, Richard Black. Uh, two former CIA agents, Graham Fuller and Ray McGovern, who know what the CIA does. Uh, Helga zeppler spoke. A courageous young journalist, Ava Bartlett, gave a report from the Donbass of, of what's being done to the people who live there in eastern Ukraine. We've had many of these conferences, and we have these conferences to provide the information that's being censored. The title yesterday was, We Will Not Be Silent, Speaking the Truth in a Time of War. You know, they say truth is the first casualty of war, and we're seeing that with the use of a hit list to try and silence people who don't go along with the policies of the great powers. But these great powers are collapsing. As Jason pointed out, there's economic crises that are eroding the, the basis for these nations to have a strong military. You know, Germany's running out of ammunition. The United States can't produce enough ammunition for the demands of Zelensky. Why? Because we don't have a skilled workforce, because we don't have factories, because making steel is considered bad for the environment. Now, I'm not in favor of armaments, but we don't have steel for bridges either. Bridges are collapsing in Germany. Now everyone thinks German technology is so great. I, I've lived here six years. Since I've been here, three major bridges have collapsed and it's taken four years to rebuild two of them. The Chinese rebuild bridges overnight practically. So we're looking at what President Putin called a moment of transformation of the world. And as Jason just said, the Western countries are saying, no, you have to do our model. You have to do what we say. And most of the world is saying, no, if you go with the Green New Deal, it means you're going to be burning wood and, and various forms of biomass, which won't produce the electricity to allow the growing population of Africa to have an opportunity for the future. What the Chinese are saying with the Belt and Road Initiative and the Russians is let's skip over a generation of technology to new technologies, plasma technologies, space, nuclear fusion. And this is the real future for Africa. So what's being fought over Ukraine right now is this question of are we going to have an, a world order dominated by one superpower and one set of rules and one economic model, which is failing? or the opportunity for sovereign nations to make their choices in collaboration with other sovereign nations for mutual benefit. That's why it's so important that people speak out at our conferences. And I commend you for having this discussion because this is something you don't usually hear from the people in Africa, don't usually hear from the West. You don't hear very many people come on a program and condemn Western colonialism. But it's important to know for people in Africa that you have allies in the United States, as bad as the US government is right now, the American people would like to see Africa have an opportunity to develop the same way the Americans had an opportunity after our revolution against the British. Remember, we were colonial people under the British Empire. We learned something about that, but we seem to have forgotten it. Well, maybe we can rediscover our past traditions in the hopes and dreams and imagination of young children in Africa who won't accept the idea that there's only one model, and that's the Western model. So that, I think, is what the ultimate fight is, not only for Ukraine, 
but the fight for truth against these censorship and these liars who try to limit the options of people to uh, real intelligence. Of course, uh, censorship, uh, it's bringing uh, us to, to look at the role of the, the media. Um, uh, Jason Ross, uh, this uh, a question I'm directing to you, look at the role of the media. We know that the media has uh, uh, the capacity to build the world and the media has the capacity to destroy the world through the, the uh, news given and the quality of information it passes or the passes out. Uh, out to to the general public now that journalists have been included in the hit list uh, uh, how can the media properly carry out uh, uh, the, the the work of actually informing the general public on what is truth on objective uh, uh, reporting now that uh, the, the journalists are, are being put on the hit list and some of already uh, lost their lives who so, we'll talk about the, 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 the Russian journalists who died uh, recently. So what can we do at, as this, uh, at this juncture to ensure that the media performs the role it has to play positively? Hmm. I think one of the biggest ways to create that pressure is through the growth of alternative media sources. By alternative, I mean in distinction to the New York Times or the Washington Post or the London Economist. These institutions aren't really news agencies, they're propaganda agencies. You know, there is a joke that the difference between Pravda, the newspaper in the Soviet Union, and the New York Times is that in the Soviet Union, people knew the newspaper was propaganda. <laughs> But perhaps people in the West don't realize that what they're, they're purchasing today um, is propaganda. Look at the example for in 2003. So many of the media repeated the idea that Saddam Hussein in Iraq was producing weapons of mass destruction. The nation's sovereignty was violated. Perhaps as many as one million Iraqis lost their lives in an illegal and unjust war. Where was the media at that time? So it is an extreme irony today to hear from media that lied about Russia putting Donald Trump in office to then claim, oh, we have to stop disinformation when they are such large purveyors of disinformation. And instead of trying to supposedly stop disinformation, perhaps they should be standing up for the freedom for journalists to express their views, to follow a story wherever it leads, to investigate. You know, Harley and I are on this list now. There are many journalists on the Merit Voret's kill list. Uh, you know, even President Museveni is on this list. So this is a very broad list. But also consider, for example, the fate of Julian Assange. He reported documents that were accurate and that large and powerful institutions did not approve of. He is now being prosecuted under an antique and I believe unconstitutional law in the United States for the crime of the freedom of speech, essentially. So any journalist that doesn't say, hey, what about Julian Assange, for example? Any journalist who doesn't say, hey, what about the freedom of journalists to visit Donbass, to express their views? Maybe it's different. Maybe they're wrong. But now the European Union is applying sanctions to journalists who report, observed and wrote reports about the voting in the referenda there. Was their reporting accurate? That's not the issue. The thing is that the European Union is now saying that if you were assisting these referenda, even by reporting on them, your assets will be seized. You will lose your bank account. No one will be allowed legally to provide you with money. Well, how do you live? How do you buy food? How do you pay your rent if you are not allowed to have a bank account? I mean, this is, I mean, this is, you can't live this way. So this is a terrible injustice uh, against journalism, against the freedom to talk. And it, it's extremely important to defend it and to speak out, even 
if you disagree with the person, you have to defend the right of people to express their views, to put out their viewpoints. And if they are wrong, then report why it is wrong. Don't prevent them from speaking. It's, this is, this is, um, this is really an offense against the human spirit. And, and this is where you see the corruption in the media, where other reporters won't step forward to defend their brethren and, and, and sisters uh, and allow them to be threatened and in some cases killed. An Italian journalist was just killed recently or nearly killed. He was saved by Russian soldiers. So. Unfortunately, yeah, we apologize for the interruption. Uh, we are almost culminating. Uh, coming back to you, uh, Jason Rose, uh, let's look at you. You highlighted, uh, Mr. Harley, highlighted that uh, there was a seminar yesterday or a conference yesterday to continue to talk. Jason said it doesn't matter whether you agree or disagree. Okay. Go on, go on, please. I just can say it doesn't matter if you agree or disagree with the point. If someone is clearly crazy in what they're saying, people will figure it out. But if you have a censorship, and remember where the, the famous story of George Orwell's 1984, it wasn't just that everything was censored and controlled, they rewrote history. And we're seeing that now, the attempt to rewrite the history of the British Empire by saying Queen Elizabeth was a wonderful woman and, yeah. and the British Empire was really a civilizing uh, feature for Africa and India. Well, tell that to the Irish of all the people who died because of the potato famine. Tell that to the Indians who suffered series of famines. Tell that to the children in East Africa and other parts of Africa who have no food because of Western sanctions. So this is where journalists have an important role to play and activists. And I, I think history is on our side. There's a famous saying that the truth never dies, but it often lives a miserable life. Our job is to nurture that miserable life until everyone can see the glow of truth. And that it is imperative uh, to know the global truth eh? uh, because uh, the, the seer, uh, knowledge is power. When you are informed and know exactly uh, what is happening, you can know the stance to take and, of course, have a different perspective uh, towards uh, global issues. Uh, we continue to look at uh, solutions. Uh, you highlighted, uh, Mr. Hali, uh, that uh, the, uh, uh, there was a conference yesterday to continue to talk about uh, of some of these uh, decisions taken by uh, uh, President Zelensky uh, that are not favorable to uh, the Ukrainian. Now, are there any prospects for this advocacy? Do you think, uh, because uh, highlighting that, you can see that the closure of, uh, of this website that keeps on updating lists and making people uh, live in fear. Is there hope inside that this can be put to an end? Well, we're going to the U.S. Congress uh, and talking to congressmen and asking them, are you willing to continue to fund something that's silencing Americans? Is the, the, there's $1.7 billion that was pushed into the Ukraine legislation in the US Congress by Charles Schumer. And Schumer is a Senator from New York. One of our colleagues is running against him, Diane Sayre, as an independent candidate. She's put on the hit list, which means that Schumer, this is the essence of corruption. Schumer pushed through extra funding for government operations in Ukraine, which include the censorship, censorship board that's reaching out to censor and threaten Americans, including an American running for US Senate against Schumer. Now, if that were happening in an African country, the US press would cover it and say, see, look how corrupt the Africans are. It's happening in New York City. It's happening in Washington, DC, and it's not getting coverage in the United States. So we're trying to break that story. I, I think it's an important story for people to, in the Cameroons to know about 
because you're being lectured all the time. You've got to be more democratic. You've got to be more like America. Well, is that what you want when a, a committed, aggressive, thoughtful young woman is running against a powerful U.S. senator who won't debate her, but he gives money to Ukrainian neo-Nazis to threaten her life if she speaks out? Is that the American democracy that we're supposed to hold as a model? Uh, culminating, uh, but la uh, one last word from you, uh, uh, Jason, uh, uh, regarding what do you have to say to, especially uh, uh, those who are at, uh, at the helm, those taking decisions as far as the uh, Russian-Ukraine war is concerned, what advice for other stakeholders? My primary advice would be to push for and to demand the negotiations proceed. This is a global crisis, and it should not be decided upon solely by NATO and Ukraine. As we talked about in the beginning of this program, this is having effects on trade, on commerce, on energy prices, dramatically increasing the prices of energy, fertilizer for everybody on this planet. This will kill people. This is already disrupting necessary agriculture for the food that we need to eat to live. So it's important for all stakeholders in this to say, we demand that negotiations proceed, that the goal of trying to achieve a military victory, a military defeat of Russia, which that's not going to happen. Russia is willing to put what it, whatever it takes into this. Instead, there must be discussion, there must be negotiations, and there has to be a recognition that the only type of security that truly works is an inclusive form of security. How can you be safe if your neighbor is not developing? How can you be safe if your neighbor feels threatened? Long-term security is long-term development. It's working together on collaborative projects. That's the kind of security this world needs security from disease, security from hunger, security from poverty, security from famine. Let's achieve that kind of security and let's put towards that the same level of resources that NATO seems to be perfectly willing to spend on deadly weapons being sent into Ukraine in massive numbers. Indeed, uh, peace uh, attract uh, development. Uh, coming to you, Holly, uh, one last statement before we end the show. Well, I think what Jason was just saying is extremely important, and it goes back to what Pope Paul VI said, that development is the name of peace. The idea that you appeal to people just to put down arms without giving them a capability to assure a future doesn't work. That's why Lyndon LaRouche is known around the world for his economic proposals for transportation and infrastructure, energy infrastructure, education, health infrastructure. That's the basis for peace. And it's also not a question of giveaways. You know, people are saying, oh, we don't want to spend all this money to help Africa. People in Africa aren't asking the Americans to give them money. They're asking for an opportunity including an opportunity to share in the benefits of technologies, which we should be more than generous to provide. And that's the basis for peace. And that's why I would urge people, go to the website of the schillerinstitute.com, and you can see yesterday's, the October 6th uh, webcast, We Will Not Be Silenced. And you could get from that a much more full picture of what Jason and I have been discussing about the mobilization to break the censorship, break the threat. And that kind of example is an inspiration to people that they should also speak up. Uh, we also have on the Schiller Institute website all kinds of material about a new Bretton Woods system, a new credit policy for development of Africa, Asia, South America. This is a whole new world that's coming into existence. And we need new people to work with us, including people from Africa to become part of the Schiller Institute, to work with us to put together the kinds of projects and the picture 
of the potential for the future. So I, I thank you for this opportunity for this discussion. And I would urge your viewers, check it out. And if you're interested, send us a note, join with us to make this new paradigm come into existence. Indeed, uh, reshaping or changing uh, the, the paradigm or a paradigm shift into bringing a solution to the uh, Russian-Ukraine crisis with the global world feeling, especially the economic uh, effect of this. I thank you so much, Jason Russ, and of course, Halish Slanger, for your great uh, analysis on uh, this uh, uh, very important topic. The, the, the Russia and Ukraine war, how can people talk constructively in times of war without fear of being uh, enlisted as a uh, propagandist? Oh, uh, that is what uh, we are talking about. How can we stop hijacking critical thinking that needs to bring solution to the many problems faced by the global world? Thank you so very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is how we saw it in the program Views on the Continent. Keep trusting the Pan-African television. And I would draw the curtains now, but don't go away. Stay tuned. <laughs>